Kaladi is very experienced at doing family supportive housing. We've been doing it since 1995, and we operate um, 206 units of family supportive housing, um, and, and another 200 of uh, housing for single adults. The funding streams for the two are different, and so are a lot of the policies, rules, and regs, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. It's a little drier than some of the <laughs> clinical issues that we normally hear about in family supportive housing, but it's very important to the operation of these programs. We have, uh, for our family supportive housing, seven different funding streams that, we, uh, that establish rules and regs about how to do our work. We're also guided by uh, the rules and regulations of rent stabilization, low income tax credits, and so forth. And all of these have an impact on the experience of living in family supportive housing. What I'm going to talk about specifically, though, is really what happens when a family composition changes. In family, in single housing, you have an occupied unit or you have an unoccupied unit, whereas in family supportive housing, you have a changing membership within your household. People are added or people move out of it over time. And all of those have, in terms of the policies, that I'm going to talk about today, they affect what happens when this family changes its composition. Okay, let's start at the front door. If somebody is coming into family supportive housing, what our policies tell us, um, I should back up just for a second and let you know that each of these seven different funding streams has its own set of rules and regs, but for the purposes of consistency across our various programs, we operate four congregate housing and multiple scattered site family programs, we, we use the same policy and, and, and procedures for all of them so that there's no so that the staff understand that all of the programs had a, uh, what, it, what are the expectations and they can implement them across the board regardless of which program they, they work within. Okay, so at the front door, what's asked of us uh, uh, is that we have to, you have to establish the eligibility criteria for people who move into your housing. Uh, and it's always uh, an income need-based housing that has to be established. And if on top of that, layered on top of that, are things like a disability. Most of our housing, for most of our housing, but not all of it, the disability is the head of the household has a substance abuse disorder, a history of substance abuse. So those are the qualifying characteristics to get into any of our supportive housing. On top of that, you have to be a member of a house. You have to be a member of a family. You can't be a single person living in a family unit. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about now is what happened. Uh, I want to give you a couple of examples of families living in our housing and see how the effect of upsizing or downsizing effect, affected different policies that had to be put into into use. Okay, we, we have an example of one of our families in one of our congregate housing where everybody qualified. The family moved in. The head of the household had a substance abuse disorder. He was homeless. Uh, his, he was income eligible. He moved in with his family. And um, shortly thereafter, the, the uh, wife and children left the house. Mm -hmm. So he was a single adult living in family supportive housing. He was essentially ineligible for this housing at this mm -hmm. point. So what we, as a, as a program, had to, and our, my staff here is very familiar with the situation since they lived it, um, mm -hmm. they had to notify the funder that the, we, it was no longer operating as a family unit, and they had to negotiate with the funding agent how to manage the situation. It was managed in two ways. One is was fairly typical when the family composition changes, you upsize or downsize the apartments that are available in the building. So in this case, he was immediately moved into a smaller family unit in the building. Instead of evicting him, which in fact, because he was ineligible, was one option, it was decided between the funder and our staff that they would instead develop a service plan with him so that he would and that would fully concentrate on a relocation plan. This was developed. You know, he, uh, they worked on a relocation plan for him, the happy year 
somewhat happy ending, I guess, is that he has since moved out and uh, seems to have found housing for himself on Long Island, but that was one type of downsizing situation. Downsizing is more unusual than upscaling, upscaling. And that happens when we have families who most typically when a partner joins the household or a baby joins the household. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. We have um, a family in which a single mother moved in with her school-aged child. Um, she then um, had developed a romantic relationship with uh, somebody who visited the building frequently. And, he, and she applied to us to have his name added to um, the document of, uh, that defines who are the occupants this, the certification document that defines who are the occupants of the apartment. We were moving ahead with this when we were notified that this gentleman, who was a New Jersey resident, and that's significant in this case because we don't track, do background checks or, or investigations for people who live in New Jersey, was a um, registered sex offender. Okay. So that changed the whole dynamic of managing this household. Um, the mother continued to want to have a relationship relationship with this individual, but she was then, we could no longer entertain him either as a prospective occupant of the apartment mm -hmm. or even as a visitor into the building. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the uh, policies that I think probably all of you do in your housing. You, when incidents like this occur, they can occur in terms, uh, there's a lot of steps that, it, that the program has to go through to ensure that the the safety and security of everybody in the building is maintained. So, again, other the somewhat, I suppose, neutral end to this story is that the mother, who still believed in this relationship, moved out and joined him elsewhere. So that was, um, but I have a more successful. <laughs> I don't. I'm not going to leave you with that. Um, we have another family in, living in one of our family supportive units where the mother and her adult son live in the building and her um, adult daughter, pregnant adult daughter, wish to rejoin the household. Yeah. So when we, and this was, um, you know, our staff felt that this was not only appropriate, it was a good decision for the entire family, and so they proceeded with the steps of bringing, uh, enlarging the family. So the first step in when you do change family composition or the number of occupants in the household is to do a uh, tenant income certification. Um, this happens at the front door when people move in, but it also happens whenever there's a change in the number of people living in the household. So during this, um, the, any adult member moving into the household has to register their income, their social security, their identification, and so forth. And so this was done in this case. She was, uh, the family was determined to be eligible for the household. Um, a background check was done. This is something that we as an agency have established as a policy, and during the background check, we check on credit, criminal background, and landlord-tenant history. That's not something that's required by our funding agency, but we consider it a best practice. It does not impact on a decision of, as to whether or not somebody is going to be admitted into the housing, but it re unless, uh, well, it doesn't impact on whether they're going to be admitted uh, specifically, but it, what it it's designed to do is to help guide our clinical practice with them afterwards if they're if they have had long ongoing criminal involvements or if they have credit histories we work on those issues with them the only exception to that is if there's arson or I'm finished. You can start wrapping up. I can start wrapping up. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so the happy ending to that story is that this family is um, has be, has been uh, reunited. They're living in this house. Mm -hmm. They moved into a larger unit, which is a second step that goes. Mm -hmm. um, the the size of the household is, determines the size of the unit, and there's a lot of switching back and forth of families living in, in supportive housing as the family composition changes. Thank you.